If you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of four obscure bloodlines in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the Gangrel bloodlines, clans Lianun, Noriad, Aramains, and Ander. The Gangrel are certainly an interesting bunch, aren't they, Neonate? Proud masters of the wild, accepting the beasts as a part of themselves. To think of them as humble tribesmen is most unwise, as they don't take too kindly for the arrogance of civilization. They live for the bloody hunt and brutal interventions, trading war stories with others of their ilk. But you know this already, for we have spoken in great detail regarding the outcasts a few moons ago. As such, you know there is far more to them than being beastly vampires whose presence is a mere mockery of true beast men, but do not tell Beckett I said that. Actually, do tell him. I would love to see that insufferable scholar squirm in his boots. But I digress. As a clan of aggressive vagabonds, the Gangrel are thus a clan of culture and celerity. Most Gangrel will embrace an individual and leave them to fend for themselves for a bit to prove their worth before returning to teach the ways of established Western kindred society. But what happens when the sire does not return? What happens when the child is stuck to their own devices forevermore? They build their own culture by twisting what they already know, form interesting clan weaknesses, form their own politics, absent from the main clan, and, in some cases, develop their own disciplines. No doubt there have been countless of unique Gangrel variants over the course of our history, some of which I had mentioned before, but four of these bloodlines have become a part of our history for various reasons. But let us provide some context as I regale the tale of Anoria. Anoria is the commonly accepted name for the Gangrel Antediluvian, and was most certainly female, according to Beckett and so many others, although he didn't need to tell me that, for I already knew that Anoria means the female half of God, who is said to be the child of Lilith. Anoria was abandoned by Lilith and lived with a pack of wolves that raised her, allegedly having a child with them. This is the origin story of how werewolves came to be, well, one origin story anyway, which says a lot about the werewolves if they encouraged the idea of bestiality. Presuming that Anoria was a mortal, she left the wolves and travelled to the second city, where she was embraced by either Enoch, Lilith, or Trachian, the Ravno Antediluvian, becoming the Gangra Antediluvian in the process. We know that Anoria and her many childer would travel, as many a Gangra would, embracing who and what they pleased. Odin, Rufus, and Vula the Red are some of said childer of Anoria, but the one I want you to turn your attention to is Adubro the Brave. Yes, I am more than aware that it is often in debate whether he was the child of Anoria, but that is not the point I want you to focus on. Drubru was the founder of the Ander bloodline, the Gangro offshoots who rode with the Mongols during the Dark Ages. Whilst the Gangro and Ander recognize and respect their similarities and shared ancestry, perhaps even working together sometimes, the Ander have their own origin story, or rather, De Brule has his own origin story of how his bloodline was created that has been passed down ever since. In life, De Brule the Brave was one of the sons of Mother Itugen, the Mongolian Earth Goddess. When Itugen came under attack by Zaya demons, which we understand to be the Wong Kuei, De Brule was by her side, waging a bloody war against the Quasian for many days and nights. Even when she had retreated, he stood his ground. One of these Kafians was said to have laid a curse on him, summoning a great fireball from the sky to strike him down, which I personally find highly unlikely. Naturally, the impact did not kill him, but instead forced him deep into the earth, where the demon shaman's curse and Itogen's embrace combined together to reshape him into a powerful Methuselah. Unable to truly return to his family, he created a brood of spiritually acclimated undead warriors in the form of the Ander, and imparted onto them his fierce hatred for the Zaya demons, the Wong Kuei, the Kuei Jin. 
The Anda do not view themselves as one of the damned amongst the Mongols from which they are embraced. They believe they have been given a unique role to play amongst their people, protecting their brothers and sisters who travel during the day, acting as riders of the night, much like the eagles that is their clan crest. This is also reflected in the rigorous training program each Tatar would go through upon the embrace to prove they were worthy to uphold their role, involving developing their protean discipline to effectively meld with the earth how they fare in battle and so forth. When in times of need when food and liquids were scarce, the Mongols would gain sustenance from horse blood and the Ander were no different. The mortal herd would begrudgingly accept that the Ander would have to feed upon them on occasion as well. They had a duty to uphold after all. Local militias who knew of the Mongolian armies knew not to attack them at night, for the Ander leave no survivors. This is partly down to the feared and notorious and yet often misinterpreted bloodthirst that you are probably aware of the Mongols possessing, but it is also because the Ander are wise enough not to let anyone speak of the monster wolfmen that are spat out of the abyssal darkness. Their own people are suspicious of them too of this fact. How else do you describe a medieval civilian why these people catch fire in the sunlight? The Mongols were tough to fear, but they were just as superstitious as the rest of the kind during those dark nights. Even family members of the Ander who knew of their plight could be wary of individuals who could shapeshift, communicate with animals and withstand a lot of pain. Indeed, some did stick with their families, granting them a permanent haven that way. Some had more stable fixtures in Mongolian cities, serving the hierarchy that way. Most however would travel with the combating and conquering Mongols, travelling on horseback, having up to four havens, depending on the location of the herd, with their own vampiric order based upon their mortal counterparts, as led by the local Noyan. The leading Ander adopts this title, you see, usually the lowest generation, but it is more a requirement for the Noan to be experienced with authority than anything else. This sense of familial unity was so important to the Ander that it was embedded into their blood, manifesting itself as a clan weakness, suffering great loneliness when not with their people, which is said to kick in one hour after sunset, as their mortal herd would begin to retire for the night. I had read some old scriptures once that some Tartars suffered from the beast markings that their gangrel cousins experienced, but not with every frenzy. It would seem it would be every other frenzy or every ten frenzies, which is certainly rather interesting to note. With their connection to their human counterparts, it would be sensible to assume they would be followers of the Road of Humanitas, the Road of Humanity. This is a most unwise assumption to make, for the Mongols would not shy away from murder, a sin for those following the road of humanity. Whilst some would follow the road of the beast, like many of the Gangrel in which they are spawned from, most followed the road of Yasa, a minor road made by and for the Ander. From my understanding from some of my documents I once read, Yasa is a Mongol code of conduct created by Chinggis Khan that all must observe. The Ander twisted this to fit their liking, focusing on honour, respect and loyalty for one's family and those they have sworn spiritual kinship with. Whilst very similar to the path of chivalry, a path found under the Road of Kings, honour found in the Road of Yasa is quite different. Tartars will do everything and anything to win, whether using spies, deceit, ambush and confusion. All are viable if it puts them on an even playing field. Putting yourself at a disadvantage was not seen as honourable, because you do not show your faux respect, according to the ethics of Yasser anyway. To my immediate knowledge, no Ander are found in the modern night, so at least they do not identify themselves as such. It was during the 14th century, when the bloodline was at its heyday, with Kublai Khan at the helm, crippling many Wonkwe courts, the Black Tortoise Court being the most infamous, in addition to diabolizing many an Eastern prince. When Kublai passed, so did the bloodline. As the Yawan dynasty was shattered and the Ming dynasty with vengeful Wang Kui in its ranks, they sacked the Karakorum in the 1360s. After that, the Kafians began a pogrom against the Tartars, with the ultimate destruction of the bloodline taking place sometime in 1388. That said, Kui Jin legend states that the Ando will return on the dawn of the Sixth Age, which we would call Gehenna, with Dabral the Brave at the helm. Now whether you choose to believe this is entirely down to you. I'll be honest with you, child. I would be very surprised if you believed in Gehenna and the mythos of Cain. It is superstitious waffle to your unenlightened ilk, 
and when I tell you there was a breed of kindred that lived in the far north of Scandinavia, the free kingdoms of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, lands where the sun would not sleep during the summer, you would probably laugh at that. I did once, as few canines have beholden the northern lights or could survive those inhospitable climates. The Noriad did, for a time, regularly watch the northern lights, believing it was the sacred duty of them to interpret this will of the gods for the Sami folk, the nomadic aborigines of this most northern of lands in which they choose to protect in exchange for their blood. Realistically, they had all specs instead of fortitude that allowed them to do this, but they probably had some personal experience with divination before being chosen for the embrace. It is highly likely they were the first breed of vampire to claim Europe as their home. The Noriads travel with wherever the mortal herd goes, with said mob constructing mobile havens that could be dragged behind them by hand by the might of caribou and reindeers. Otherwise, Noriad would have to sink in the earth and catch up the following night, assuming that it was winter. During the summer, the Noriad would pretty much be in torpor. I suspect the Sami folk must have been in awe, watching their shamanic deity-like figures become one with the soil and snow and just appear the next night. Again, they saw them not as vampires. The Noriad are a very strained bloodline whose past is incredibly vague for a number of reasons. They are certainly alien when compared to other Cainites, often described as being ghost-like in shape, covered in animal skins and the like, whilst I think it is more likely that they have frenzied, bearing multiple beast marks. As you may have already assessed, they are nothing like the Gangrel they are probably offshoots of. Some Cainite scholars speculate whether they are actually Cainites at all, some suggesting they are cursed lupine creatures through God's unforgiving might. Their curse reflects that of Sami legend, in that they could not slate their thirst from animals. They do not socialise much beyond their interactions with the Sami folk, which is a very loose application of the term socialise. It is actually their heavy involvement with the Sami, the insistence and demand of it all that would be their own downfall. A reminder that the Noriads are kindred and the blood of Cain corrupts all that it touches. The Noriad would protect the Sami and only they would be allowed to protect them, stunting the people's will and desire to develop and evolve as outside influences started creeping in. When the execution of interlopers was not enough, the Noriads pushed the Sami folk further north, driving their people to accept Extinction. I assume the Noriad would join them in that fate, considering that their one piece of legend is false. What legend, you ask? Well, only that these quasi-vampires are said to be guarding blood magic so powerful and ancient that it puts the Tremere to shame. Frightening to think about that for sure, but they are not the only Gangro offshoot with blood sorcery at their disposal, which you should remember regarding our conversation on blood sorcery. I refer to the Lianon, but don't tell any Gangro or Lianon they are of the same cloth. I mean it this time. Both breeds of Canite despise each other, and the Lianon do not believe they are connected to the Gangrel at all. In fact, the two have very little in common besides animalism. Most Canites who knew of the Lianon that populated the British Isles and small pockets of Eastern Europe feared them, mostly because the Lianon are a territorial, matriarchal and Judaic Canite bloodline whose mutilated pagan beliefs and twisted practices were often confused with heinous witchcraft and were thus seen as enemies of the predominantly Christian Canites invading their homes. The magic I speak of is a form of cultonic sorcery known as Argum, combining Celtic runes and mortal sacrifice to inflict curses that manipulate the natural world and buff themselves to be stronger. Argum is a natural discipline for the Lianon, unlike Cordonic sorcery for the old clan Zemitsi. Argum is a limited form of blood magic. It is neither as flexible nor as powerful as any other blood sorcery type, but it can be just as, if not more so powerful, within the Lianon territory. The further away the Lianon is from their haven, the discipline's potency is weakened. Some would argue it is 50 miles before this potency is noticed, whilst others say it is a mile before the discipline weakens, as do they should when they leave their haven for more than a week according to a few I spoke to many moons ago, which is down to being part nature spirit, allegedly. The Lianon do have some association with the old clan Zemitsi, acting as one of the tutors of Crania to the Koldons, Crania being Koldonic rites and rituals. The other tutors 
in case you were wondering, were mostly other demons. The Lianan are not diabolizing demons, mind you, despite popular Catholic belief into the eerie presence they give off. That is not me being nasty towards them or me saying that they abuse their presence discipline, which they probably do on occasion. They honestly present a supernatural aura. Mortals know immediately there is something off with them, that they are not of this world, so to speak. Some would argue that there is something wrong with them. As Lianan belief dictates, they are descendants of the Crone, the witch who inadvertently taught Cain the power of the blood bond and what a wooden stake to the heart can do. Some would argue that the Crone is Baba Yaga, an aunt of mine of sorts, or the Dark Mother, Lilith herself, but that is a conversation for another time, perhaps. The Lianan commune with spirits and nature, finding themselves at the heart of forests, deep dark caves and other deep entrenched rural areas, and lambast any intrusion onto their domains. Even if it involves burying themselves into the dirt, lacking protein to do so, they are far away from any mortal, relying on animals and lost individuals, luring them in with animalism and presence respectively. I witnessed firsthand once some of these Lianan, covered in rags and branches, venture into rural towns and villages as they attempted to fight back the countries Mithras and other invading Canaanites stole from them. It didn't really work for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the Lianna never really had any sort of organization, which was their biggest downfall. They chose this, however, and their near obliteration in the 14th century is down on them. I say near obliteration, for I know a few live in the woods surrounding my home, but you needn't worry about most of them. They cannot do much harm to me. Oh, and you as well. You see, when a Lianan embrace, the spirit shard I spoke of earlier is weakened, for it is shared with the carefully chosen child. The generation of the sire actually raises upon the embrace, meaning sire and child share the same generation, becoming more a generational sibling. It is a very unusual quirk to say the least, but not as unusual as their preferred road they follow. A fair amount of them follow the path of Eightfold Wheel or the path of Watchful Gods, paths found in the Road of Sin, which are tailor-made for them, focusing on god worship and encouraging their sacrifices. But no, apparently, most Lianan follow the Road of the Beast, dismissing the premises of society, culture, people, and the will and means to judge others as a group. Apostates exist purely on their own terms. Hmm. That was probably something else that caused the Lianan to become an endangered species. But let us move on to the final ye old Gangru offshoot neonate, one you have probably heard was once part of the Sabbat. Ooh, I see by the look in your eye that you know what I am talking about for a change. Yes, an incarnation of the Aramains do usually associate themselves with the Sword of Cain and I see you have that confused puppy look again. <sighs> Yes, child, there have been two versions of them, so I shall start with the original Aramanes, or occasionally known as the Valkyries. Addissa was a Valkyrie, daughter of Freya, who travelled far and wide, drawing the attention of a Persian king by the name of Araman, who commanded Addissa to fight by his side in his army. She refused, angry that the entitled king declared war on his powerful woman, taking on most of his men, unwilling to submit. She would be bested by a warrior on the third day of combat, nearly dying. Refusing to retreat, Freya and her daughter Adissa hid for three nights, not days, to allow her to rest and take her revenge. It was at this point the dying Adissa was embraced. Adissa attempted to fight back with her animalism, but the king killed all the animals. Then she talked to their spirits through her unique discipline, Spiritus, which allows one to communicate and summon spirits of animals and objects to battle to accompany the canine. Araman bricked up the doors and windows of his large castle, now terrified at this powerful woman angrily tearing down his castle, brick by brick, with an impressive use of potence. She killed the king, claiming his name and placing an E on the end. She would return home, embrace the rest of the women, now donning the clan name of Aramans, before scattering across the coasts of Scandinavia, Scotland and Ireland primarily, with some in England and Normandy in France. As you would expect, the medieval Aramane's bloodline bound to no one, annoying European princes to no end, never feeling the need to be a part of their territory, much preferring their surprisingly organised and nomadic lifestyles. They cannot be bloodbound or bloodbound others. They cannot create ghouls and even if they could, I would not think they would want to. It is against their very nature after all, making me think they preferred the road of beasts or the road of kings, but I cannot be certain. What I am convinced of is that they don't really do well in cities, unsure how to blend in and who and what to feed upon, 
without causing too much attention. Not that they discriminate on who they feed upon, mind you. Anyone will do, except for breastfeeding mothers, infants, and pregnant women. It makes sense, given that Freya, Odysseus' mother, is a goddess of fertility. When they are in the wild, for lack of a better term, they leave rune scripts for our remains to notice, like whether a spot is good for hunting or to avoid this place where it is home to lupines, for example. The fact they are a woman-only bloodline angered some canines as well. Truth be told, their fighting skills often surpassed that of anyone else. I did question one Iron Man once about this, and I was told of a few stories where men were embraced into the bloodline as well, men who were women in spirit as I was told. They preferred spirit over body, as we all should. Like the previous unique Gangro offshoots, the Valkyries were wiped out, long forgotten by most of us, but the Iron Mains would reappear in a different guy sometime during the 1990s, the exact date escapes my mind. Anyway, it is a strange tale regarding a Gangro anti tribu called Murica, who was caught between two warring Sabat Gangro factions, watching her packmates destroy each other in what could only be described as a senseless conflict. Not only did she remove herself from the Sabat, but she also detected attached herself from the Gangrel clan as well, identifying herself as an Araman. It is said that she used some sort of magic to literally alter her biological makeup, granting her the discipline's presence and spiritus instead of fortitude and protein, and not animalism, potence and spiritus that the medieval Aramanes possessed. That said, I am aware some share the same spread of disciplines of the Nuriad, animalism, or specs and protein. There are a couple of theories as to how she managed this magical transformation. Some would suggest that she was an anomaly before she attempted this magic. Some state she used shamanic formaturgy to alter herself, unknowingly sparking a lingering trance of Odyssa's infamous independence inside of her. This latter theory is the most accepted one amongst educated canine scholars, so remember that well, Neonate. You would also do well to remember that in addition to being unboundable and unable to ghoul or blood bond individuals, but due to their magical properties of their very existence, the blood of modern knight Aramanes is very much inert. They cannot embrace either. Marisha would then offer all female gangrels this transfiguration, most of which being African American or Native American women. As gangrels, expect to see them with their beast marks and behave as a gangrel would, be it in a much more angry state. And if you are ever in doubt whether you are speaking to an Aramean or gangrel, call them a cat. Marisha is famous for her cat-like eyes, which got the independent Aramanes of the modern knights that is a nickname. The chances of you speaking to one, however, are rather slim. Partly this is down to the fact that they operated mainly in the southern United States, but mainly because they do not seem to be around anymore. I know not what happened to them, but most who noticed this disappearance seem to believe that they are either dead or gone on some sort of spiritual pilgrimage with Marisha. Both are quite likely, but I suspect the former to be the case. Why? Because they, like their ancestors and the other Gangrel offshoots, the Ander, Lianan, and Noriads, they refuse to go with the tide. Yes, to surf, one must begin by swimming against the current, but if you keep going in that same direction, you will drown and ultimately suffer. All of these almost mythical canines showed great potential to contribute to something meaningful to our society, but they actively destroyed themselves. It almost makes the Anux look organized. To be kept updated, Follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.